So what do I think the role of business in society is? Um, I have my own view, which is, um, and maybe it's what I want business in society to be, but I, and I actually think business is, a, is an agent of development in society, which is not what, what a lot of people might say. I think it means different things to, to different people. I think it can benefit a lot of people, uh, but I think it can also hurt a lot of people. It can benefit its owners, its customers, uh, society at large, but it can also damage those people and it can damage its own owners, I guess, as well. For me, it's what business is for, what it does, and then the manner in which it does it. So it can do it well, it can do it in a way that makes people's lives better, and it can do it in a way that hurts people or hurts the environment. It can do it, I guess you could say nicely, and it can do it sort of brutally and callously. I tend to focus on, on, on the company, which isn't every aspect of business, but if we look at, if we look at say, the history of the, of the company, and, and that goes right back to, uh, to Roman times or even, or even before, we've had companies, groups of people, uh, which share a mission to do something. And companies originally were, it's changed over time, rich companies originally were very much more, uh, quite often agents of state uh, to do things like build housing, uh, have, you know, get social projects, done um, and then very much sort of private businesses um, I'm kind of uh, also interested in if you look back at things like the, the East India Company or the Dutch uh, that was the British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company uh, which became massive companies actually sort of embarked on state enterprises overseas sometimes very brutally um, but of huge profit to, to, to their home country it wasn't until we incorporated companies in the mid-19th centuries, around the 1850s, 1860s, and we gave them this privilege of limited liability. That went on in the UK in particular, but also in different parts of the States. Uh, it was a state-by-state -state thing in the US. Um, the, uh, and the joint stock company came about, that we started to grow something that looks like the, the modern company. But if you look also at things like the Quaker companies, in Victorian Britain and in America. Um, companies like Western Union or the from the chocolate companies like Cadbury's or Clark's Shoes that had a social mission. They, they, they chose what they embarked upon. They chose the businesses. They wouldn't do certain types of business. They chose their businesses. They also um, benefited their employees. They built social housing, they built schools. And they saw their mission as a, as a societal mission. They made money, but they, um, and many of those companies exist now. They've, they've been long-term companies. But for me, something particularly changed in the 1980s um, with a sort of sharpening of, 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 the, of the purpose of a company being about, almost entirely being about profit, relatively short-term profit, so shareholder value. And people often say shareholder value is long-term, but actually companies tend to be measured on a quarterly basis. That we, for me, we, we lost any broader purpose. I certainly think expectations have changed. I think it's an interesting question is whether how much companies have changed in, in response to that. How much of it is um, defence, reputational defence, what you might call band-aid uh, type activities, and how much is fundamental changes in, in mission. But I think companies now, so oil companies, 20 years ago belonged to a coalition that tried to stop any action on climate change and that changed in the 1990s and uh, oil companies, some of the leading oil companies now uh, amongst the, the people calling for carbon tax agents or carbon trading systems um, uh, and that's partly because society expects them to deal with their products. And I think lots of companies now are dealing with things that 20 years ago they wouldn't have seen on their radar, you know, freedom of expression for Google and Yahoo or water usage for Coca-Cola and it's not just business it is also about societal expectations but I'm not sure if you dig deep whether that those companies see their purpose as changing I think they see this as oh, we need to do this in order to enable our purpose which is shareholder value there are some companies that have always um, Hewlett-Packard maybe is one have always expressed a social mission rather than 
than a than simply uh, a, a, a profit mission. So a company a shareholder value is simply two things: the dividend stream and the share price. So you're driven to one make profit quarterly because dividends are paid paid quarterly, and and two drive up your share price, often by making your company bigger or by or by uh, up, upgrading the assets of it. But it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's often quoted now, but Paul. Polman at Unilever has said he doesn't want Unilever to report quarterly and he's also said that he doesn't get up in the morning, I'm paraphrasing I think, um, in order to increase shareholder value he gets up because he wants to satisfy his customers. I might ask for a broader social mission than that but it's still not a short-term mission. So one of the things that um, I think we don't really explore enough and think about enough is although it's coming out right now because of people's concern with tax avoidance in particular is whether businesses benefit societies particularly in the places that they operate um, so the ability of a business a, a global multinational business at least now to move its profits around through internal pricing systems uh, into different tax regimes can mean that the place where the business is done doesn't always benefit from the business. And you couple that with, with what's happened in recent years, particularly with outsourcing, and particularly with sourcing from poorer countries, that businesses go to a place, Bangladesh is a recent example, where the, the, the garment factory collapsed. And we've had fires in garment factories in parts of the world as well recently. And they go to a place which has weak capacity and and what goes with weak capacity is uh, low wages, and that's why they're there. They're there because it's, it's low wages. But it also means there's weak capacity, and that means there, aren't, there isn't much in the way of government standards on, for example, building regulations for factories, or inspectors to inspect them, or even the ability to inspect them. So a country like Bangladesh, which has a GDP per capita of six, seven hundred dollars the government doesn't have the capacity to put that in place. And we have a tendency to then say that when the factory collapses, that why isn't the government of Bangladesh doing enough to maintain standards? Uh, it doesn't have the ability to do so. And, and that's why the business is there and it's making, taking advantage of a weakness in capacity and not contributing to it. So I think there's something about contributing to the place you're in. Uh, I think the various stakeholder approaches that, that have emerged uh, in the last 15 years or so take us some of the way that a business it's not just and, and in some ways what that does is it looks at what other people value so if you are concerned as a business about what your customers value what your employees value which may be time at home with their children uh, or what the society in which you operate values which may be environment it may be peace it may be stability it may be um, uh, a whole range of things, uh, then I think that starts to get you into um, into a business operating, behaving in, in a different way. They don't exist in law, of course. We, we still have the legal construct, which is that a company's, a limited liability company's responsibilities are towards its owners, pretty much. 